This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast, and here is my ready-to-talk-about-cake co-host, Jan. Cake, cake, cake. I've got this incredible co-host that really hears only the stuff he really wants to hear himself, and I think at the moment he's hungry, because I didn't mention anything like anything coming from a baker's oven. I talked about cakes with a T, and that's totally different and somewhat harder to digest, I think. Well, possibly, certainly, if you if you believe the the most recent news that's uh, circling around the intertubes, um, yes, it is indeed a, a, a bit of a discussion around Kubernetes, and and there's a few kind of different things happening right now. Obviously, Google have announced their uh, Google Kubernetes Autopilot uh, offering, um, and similarly, at the opposite end of the the spectrum. Uh, there was an article that came out around how this, the uh, the C suite should really care about <laughs> Kubernetes enabled enterprise software. So let's let's start off talking about perhaps this somewhat less contentious article around uh, Google's uh, autopilot offering for Kubernetes. I mean, the easy button for Kubernetes. What's not to love? Um... Well, as usual, I'll be the cynic on the on the show because, I mean, I'm the cynic, you're the sarcasm person, right? That's how we kind of divide <laughs> things up here. Pretty but, much, uh, yeah. I, I've looked at the autopilot myself as well, and I mean, this isn't new. This is something that's been available for a while, and it kind of emphasizes the fact that Kubernetes is actually a hard thing to manage and to do. I mean, if it didn't, if it needs an easy button, it means it's hard without the easy button. Mm-hmm. Now, this isn't new. This has been done before by uh, other companies. Most notable, I think, is OpenShift, who's been providing an abstraction layer on top of Kubernetes to make it easy to manage. And there's that open source thing as well. Um, you had the name before, I forgot Rancher. again. Rancher. Rancher was uh, recently acquired by SUSE. So there's definitely been a couple of easy buttons out there as well. But this one, again, Cynism had on. It's coming from Google to be put on their uh, service, uh, Kubernetes as a service on their GCP, Google plat- the Cloud Platform. So is this a way for them to take control back to make it harder for different people by making Kubernetes, it's complicated, let's keep it that way, but have an easy button that we can provide and nobody else? Wow, so much, so much cynicism. I apologize for, for all our listeners who have just had so much cynicism blasted in their ear holes at such high pressure um so i i don't see this as much of an abstraction layer as such uh, as sort of most of those solutions and services that you have mentioned provide additional value add on top Mm -hmm. whereas i i see this as being more of a, a a real kind of easy button a more kind of slimmed down version uh, of like just basically removing a lot of options that people would otherwise go and fiddle with and, and change and and otherwise manipulate like things like you know if you want to go and uh, spin up a kubernetes environment you just want to fill in four heat fields you know smash a button and deploy your your kubernetes that will you know scale up and scale down and do all sorts of magical things for you then this is this is your answer, but I don't I don't see it as an abstraction layer as the same way that you talk about kind of Rancher and OpenShift. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, not saying you're, you're, what you're saying isn't true, but is it a good thing to make something that is as complex and as multifaceted and functionality brim to the brim with functionality product like Kubernetes? People should know what they're doing when you play with Kubernetes. If you deploy this, if you make the decision to base your infrastructure on bare metal or virtualization or Kubernetes containerization, whatever, it's up to you to know what you're doing. And giving an easy button is, I think, a bit of a dangerous thing to do there. Well, okay. So taking a... No, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but... Oh. Progress. <laughs> to to take a um, take a, a look at one of the particular things that comes with their autopilot offering, for example, in terms of like functionality removed to make it easier, like no SSH access, say goodbye to local access to your services, and one of the reasons that they they talked about this uh, is 
removing SSH, um, it was a big deal because it's mainly that's where people had misconfigured things with the best intentions, which makes sense from a, um, you know, you can read any number of blog posts or uh, how-to articles or, God, tutorials on YouTube on Kubernetes. I'm sure they exist. It sounds like a terrible idea to me. But like, there's any number of um, areas that you can pick up all sorts of hokey guidance as to how to fix things that you might be experiencing. Um, but one of those, you know, one of those things is definitely all oh, just, you know, apply this change in, in SSH to your Kubernetes environment. And it'll fix everything. Uh, but Kubernetes is changing so rapidly, evolving so quickly that a lot of those hacks that people have probably left in their provisioning systems or like run this script after deployment or whatever, uh, or run this uh, config management tool after deployment, whatever, you know, some of this stuff is just no longer needed or, or shouldn't have been done mm -hmm. in the first place. So yeah, I, I do, I think it's exactly aimed at those people who don't have that level of, of skill or knowledge yet still want to get some of the benefits. Like surely there's a, a place where people could start using this autopilot offering at least to get familiarity with some of the fundamentals. And then sure, maybe over time they, they graduate to full fat Kubernetes. Yeah, but that kind of implies that you believe truthfully or not, that Kubernetes is over the early adopter hub. That this is now a technology that is stable enough, uh, feature complete, that it actually should be used by people that don't necessarily know what they're doing. That they should be able to consume this as a off-the-shelf product. I install it, I click a couple of buttons, I've got it up and running, and it should run maybe not at peak performance, but at least at a performance level that is acceptable. Do you think that Kubernetes, the, the, and I'm not just talking the, sing, the single Kubernetes thing, but the whole mm. ecosystem around it, how the operators are being built and the, the, the storage layers are being connected and stuff like that. Do you think we've reached that point already? Uh, so I think there's two questions. One is, do I think we've reached that point? The answer is definitely not. Mm -hmm. But the second one is, do I think there are people using it that do not have that level of skill or experience? And the answer is definitely yes. So like we may not be over that, like we may not have crossed the chasm with it as such, but that doesn't mean there are a lot of people all, like still using it that are possibly not tr traditional early adopters, but they're using it anyway and making lots mm -hmm. of mistakes. And this yeah. is this is perhaps the uh, the the bulletproof vest or the guided path <laughs> to uh, to stop yeah. them. Bulletproof shoes. There we go. Bulletproof shoes to stop them shooting themselves in the feet. Even better. I was going to say bulletproof feet. I was going to say bulletproof fast, but bulletproof feet doesn't mean you should go play football in a minefield. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a risk with this kind of stuff. Yes, because yeah. they would need to be mineproof feet, surely. I'm not talking about mine shafts. I'm talking about these explodey <laughs> things, horrible things. Yeah. Uh, but the, my, my thing is, is providing an easy button will make it more accessible so more people that don't know what they're doing mm -hmm. will be starting to use it and it will almost certainly make things worse because again providing an easy button for a complex ecosystem like kubernetes for me you need to have a stability level that actually allows that to happen because even with the easy button and especially i mean i know they remove the ssh connectivity because that's the mm -hmm. first thing everybody i will deploy it with the easy button and now I say to the systems to do it my way. Mm. It has always a loss of flexibility of uh, um, functionality, yeah. even with the, we already mentioned that, when, with an easy button. The whole idea for Kubernetes is the flexibility it offers, the things that you can build it your way. For me, this is differentiation between on-premise and in the cloud. I think that's where it kind of differentiates itself. For anything that's a SaaS service in the cloud, like TCP, like Azure, like Amazon, whatever, we have the Kubernetes and service things at the moment, but the, uh, how to say it, the, the ease of use is not there yet as a SaaS service, so you need to add more to that. And there I can see autopilot having a function. But for on-premise, I don't think the easy button is what we need. I think that's fair. I think the, the focus 
for their offering is definitely around their the the GCP GKE autopilot blah 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 they're not right. yet talking about rolling this wrapper i guess into vanilla kubernetes mm. um, again on prem i don't think it makes sense to have an easy button on prem because you people want to be able to muck around with it so well mm, yeah i i can i can see I can see a desire for a, I mean, there's a reason why things like Minikube and um, K3S and, um, is it K3S? Anyway, there's there's a number of like light, lightweight or lighter weight, simplified Kubernetes-ish um, offerings that are out there. Would different. you... I, 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 I know it's not the same thing, but I, I can definitely see a, like if you could deploy full fat Kubernetes with an on-prem easy button that for your first, I don't know, three months of using it, hid 90% of the configuration items and just allowed you no, to no, do no. some of the basics. I know you don't want like that, no, you know, but you're a particularly special individual. No. <laughs> well, yes, but <laughs> you know, just as well as I do, if people put something down for three months and then we'll go in production, we don't need security right now. We'll do it when we go to production. It never happens. They keep no, running but, the same. But maybe security is baked in by default. Like, literally, you can't switch it off. Easy That's button part security. Of easy okay, button. if you got that one, <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one. But that's one of the biggest problems to have an easy button for, I think, because again, Kubernetes yeah. has so much connectivity. And in Minikube, I kind of disagree because Minikube has a different purpose in life. Minikube is never meant to have a quick and dirty Kubernetes running. No, it's a a backend for developers to test to for DevOps engineers to try things out. It's a development tool. It's never yeah, meant but to so be could an easy button Kubernetes just slightly okay. more scalable. And in that case, in that case, it's a yes, easy button, great. I'm, I'm just writing a program, just want to see if it runs or not. Give me the easy button every day. So I have something like that autopilot thing on Minikube, which I mm -hmm. set up on my environment and it was horrible. <laughs> I would really like that. It's the easy button for a production deployment of something as complicated as this and again for the cloud environment i can see google use the easy button with care because they know what they're doing but having that available on premise is a risk for disaster and it's just like making sure that your ceo is actually well versed in kubernetes that's an easy button too right well before we go and jump on that particular landmine, going back to a previous comment, um, to let you there was one. There was one thing that um, that did make me chuckle was that essentially, uh, where is it? So there's a new um, Google. I can't remember. I can't can't find the name of the person, but there's someone someone new at Google who is X AWS. Who was talking about their onboarding experience and basically it sounds like the the new customer experience for a gcp customer is still pretty poor compared yeah. to an aws new customer and uh i they're all poor but anyway well yeah but like there's different degrees of of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of rubbishness <laughs> <laughs> but the i think this is one of the things that the article finishes off with is the comment that like there's more to adoption and improved customer experience than just getting the tech right. Like if you're if you're not helping uh, a new prospect on board or understand what they're doing or, you know, like if you can't fix that, having all of the easy button in the world won't make any difference because no one's going to or far fewer people will consume your service. So, yeah, it's definitely... It's not all about the easy button. There's a lot more, lot more to it than that. But that's that's always been like GCP's or Google's cloud services' primary problem, as far as I'm concerned. Like, generally speaking, pretty amazing service, very fast. But if you don't know what you're doing, good luck. Google Cloud is a tech demo. It's mm -hmm. more than a demo. It's production ready as well. But most of the services there are built from a technology point of view and more, more much less from the usability's point of view and that's i think where azure 
differentiate itself. Yes, I'm biased. Look at my LinkedIn. You know why? Um, but they just had a different way of looking at it, where the technology yeah. was already there, because that was the yeah the the, the, the not first uh, adopter advantage. Let's call it that. They were able to take technology that really worked, take lessons learned, and actually put a lot more effort in making it serviced and less technology based. Amazon's kind of in the middle of the two, I think. They've got some they've got some cool tech. They've got some cool services as well. It's just that the way they're doing it is a bit contentious, let's say. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is maybe Google's uh, first foray into making their stuff actually user-friendly. That would be good. I mean, hey, Google, <laughs> if you can make the API for the YouTube work again for me, that would be great, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, had to get that in there. Fair enough. All right. So yeah, let, let's pivot to the other end of this uh, particular scale, uh, which is whether whether or not the C-suite should really care about software development happening on Kubernetes or cloud-enabled software development or not. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of perfect that these two uh, articles came up at the same moment. One saying, it's so easy, even your C-level C-suite should know about this. And it's so hard, we need an easy button for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but regardless, in my opinion, okay, first there's a differentiation in the size of the company. If you're a three-person three company, okay, everybody kind of needs to know everything about everything anyway. So yeah. we're not talking about that. It's not niche, but that situation. In a normal, reasonable uh, environment where you have enough people, enough products, enough re resources happening that you actually can use something like microservices architecture, in my opinion, except for the CTO, the one that's actually doing the tech stuff, who should kind of know a little bit about technology, I would get, I would say. The rest of the C-suite shouldn't be bothered with this kind of stuff. They should be doing the big business stuff and let the technology people that actually know about this and don't need an easy button <laughs> take care of that. Yeah, I I think I'm kind of with you on this. Like, I, I can definitely... The only reason I can think that a, a C-level should really even care about Kubernetes at all is if there's if there's something fundamental going on at that organization like they're not looking at cloud or not looking at containerization or not looking at kubernetes or you know if 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 the the tech side of the organization is some you know still stuck in monolithic software development waterfall mm -hmm. on everything's on prem and like they're and that that's a problem like if if they're doing all of those things and yet their business is still amazing then like sure go not knock, knock yourself out but if 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 they're finding themselves being eaten alive by younger faster more agile competition that is adopting this technology then that's the only reason i can see that a sea level would even start kind of Thinking, well, why aren't we? Why aren't we doing these faster, more agile things? Yeah, of which see, you talk about just something. Exactly, it's it's the concept of something and the deployment of technology, the the the, the product realization of something. The the CEO, the, the the real top, should be looking at business trajectory. And if indeed the young whippersnappers are taking all the, the green grass and what's left for them, they're doing something wrong and they have to look at things. And maybe the concept of microservices architectures being able, to, again, even that's already too complicated. It's more of a, we can't innovate fast enough. Okay, what yeah. are the blockers? Look at our sales apparatus, look at our marketing apparatus, look at our IT environments. Hey, CTO, is there something we can do that could accelerate our flexibility, our go-to-market, blah, blah, blah. The CTO can go to his people and see, okay, guys, I have no, I don't really care how we do it today. I'm a bit charged, a bit uh, over, uh, exaggerated there. But is there something we can do? What's blocking you? And if it comes up, yeah, because of this monolith that we only can upgrade once every three years because it's such a hassle, we have a development or sales cycle of minimum three years, which is horrendous. <laughs> okay, can we change the monolith something else? Hey, yes, we can do something else. Okay, do give me a business proposal, uh, a return on investment thing, whatever. Tell me why. Maybe microservices, maybe something else, maybe cloud, whatever, is going to improve things. But that's lower down, the actual deployment of it. The fact that they're going to be using Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or Autopilot or whatever, that yeah. should never bother us. If a CEO is that much of a micromanagement person, 
he got bigger problems. I don't know. I'm not the CEO. <laughs> Thank God for that. Um, true. <laughs> so I think that there are a few points that the article brings up. Like one is around, um, like you as a consumer of services, if you're like looking to purchase a software solution or a SaaS platform, I guess, or like anything, then you should be the one deciding like whether or not you want this. If you, if you want something that is containerized, for example, and plugs into your existing, maybe you've already got a, a Kubernetes cloud native strategy, then you should look at solutions that plug into that rather than trying to like smash your existing, maybe less agile, mm -hmm. less flexible technologies into the new world. Cause not everything is going to fit. Not everything is going to be a, a, a seamless transition. Yeah. But again, the directions coming from the top should be much more abstract, much more in the idea sphere and let the people that you pay a lot of money for potentially that are good at making the technical decisions, make the technical mm. decisions. So if from a go, I mean, the cloud first one is, for example, is the one that I would say, yes, that's a C level exact thing because going cloud native cloud first or staying on premise that has implications across the organization from yep. data center costs to infrastructure require acquisitions to people, the kind of people you need to hire. So yeah, things like where is cloud in our business? Definitely. But then the decisions go for Azure, Amazon, Google, IBM, Alibaba, whatever. I don't even think the, the real C level, the high level should take a look at that, except if they have already existing relationships because we, we have joint development with Google anyway, makes sense. We're going to go to Google. I mean, that's that point, of course, but if it's just on a technical level, let the technical people look at that again, CTO and below, that's where that decision should be made and below should kind of bubble up to the CTO to indicate the pros and cons of all of, of all the possibilities and CTO. Well, that's the guy that gets paid a lot of money because he makes a decision and lives with the consequences after that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And like the, the other point I think the article makes that I think is a good one, but I also don't think is necessarily a C level. It, it's something that is delegated and typically is done lower down in the organization is security being, you know, invo involved or being considered throughout. Hmm. Like you could say that maybe the CIO would have that as, as under their remit, but I think it's more likely to be the CISO, like the chief information security officer. If, if an organization has one of those, they're going to be the one that cares. Okay. Are we, are we using encryption in all the right places? You know, both mm -hmm. at rest and in motion. Do we, you know, do we have these hooked in hooked all of these different services and solutions hooked into our identity management and authorization authentication platform you know do they all support an appropriate level of privilege control and escalation and all those kind of things like uh, but yeah i still see a I, level there yeah it, yeah exactly like i don't i think the the comment from this article is mostly fundamentally flawed like that like i agree <laughs> A, a C level exec is going to care about the business value that the organization is, is deriving from this. And really that's all. And then be, the individual decisions, like that should all be delegated. Like there's no way that the, the C level is going to care about whether this is, are you deploying on vanilla Kubernetes or are you deploying on OpenShift or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Again, for me, CEO, CEO, give direction. The rest mm. of the C-suite, do the ex make sure it gets executed. But the actual, this, and they say yes. And at a certain point, CEO says, we need to go security unless. It needs to be secure or we don't put it out the door. Yep. CEO take, picks it up. Okay, I'll make sure my people do this. And then ask his people, how can we make this happen? They will bubble up a couple of propositions. And the C level will have to make a decision to decision to go at some level to Azure, 
Amazon, Google to go with Kerberos or SAML or whatever. There's a decision, decision to be made that should not be made by the DevOps engineer. That's way too high up, but it shouldn't be made by the total top either. That's why you have that middle management, the whole structure of the company, let's say, to make yep. sure that that gets delegated because delegation, good delegation is how a company stays flexible, just like software. You need a microservice architecture in, it, in your management structure as well. And that's called delegation, I think. Yep. No, it makes perfect sense. Of that. <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah. Again, if your CEO is talking about what kubectl command you should be using, I think you... <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Okay. With that, anything more to add? I don't think so. I think that's all for me. Then that's all the time we have for Kubernetes for uh, today and let's say for the next couple of weeks as well. We'll see how much changes in the landscape of microservices in the future <laughs> and we'll re re revisit, of course. Until then, you can support this podcast by becoming a Patreon. Every contribution helps. We are on YouTube. You can like, subscribe, hit notification bells, do all the stuff that, well, both uh, Dave and I, I like it too. I mean, I do all of, all of this editing, so give me a little thumbs up there. Like Definitely. It. Please go to www.roaringalpha.org. There's links there to the Patreon, Patreon page and information about the podcast. You can follow me on Twitter using the at Roaring Elephant tag. And you can send your feedback by good old email to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Until next time, my name is There's No Easy Button, Jon. And my name is Is It Finally Time for Cake, Dave? It is now. We look forward to talking to you next week and the cake will be gone. Bye. See you then. <laughs>